Here comes the Luftwaffe. In dozens of flights, hundreds of planes, bombers, fighters, dive bombers, across that 21 miles of channel, that eight short minutes of water. Their first tactics were to bomb convoys in the channel, convoys loaded with food and munitions bound for the great port of London. fighters waited overhead for the defending planes of the Royal Air Force, the RAF, to appear. They didn't have long to wait. historic three-dimensional battle took place inside an area 60 miles long, 38 broad, and from five to six miles high. individual dogfights took place within the first 30 minutes of the raid.
Good morning. My name is Tim Riley. Uh, I'm the director and chief curator here at America's National Churchill Museum at Westminster College. It's my uh, privilege and honor to welcome all of you here to this hallowed ground, this wonderful church of St. Mary the Virgin Aldermanbury here at the museum. Many of you know uh, this church has a long and storied past. It was originally built in the 12th century in London. It stood proudly there uh, until the Great Fire of London in 1666 when it was engulfed in flames and virtually destroyed. Rebuilt shortly thereafter by Christopher Wren, Sir Christopher Wren, the great architect of England. Uh, and the church stood again proudly uh, for nearly 300 years until the fateful night of December 30th, 1940, in World War II, when the German Luftwaffe sent a squadron of bombers over London. This sanctuary took a direct hit. It was engulfed in flames and all but destroyed. It remained so uh, until 1960, 61, when Westminster College had the audacious idea to relocate stone by stone this church from London to Fulton as a memorial to Sir Winston Churchill, who gave his famous Iron Curtain speech on our campus. Since 1969, this church was rebuilt anew here in Fulton and stands as a symbol of resilience and the special relationship between our countries, United States and Great Britain. Today, we honor that special relationship in a particular way. We honor not only the relationship of this building and Churchill's legacy here in the United States and around the world, uh, but also the legacy of the Eagle Squadrons. In 1992, this chapel was dedicated as the official chapel of the Eagle Squadrons. The Eagle Squadrons were the, comprised of American airmen who entered and fought with the Royal Air Force before the United States entered the war. They did so under penalty of treason. They were fighting for a foreign power. Uh, but in 1992, the surviving members of the Eagle Squadrons dedicated this chapel as their official sanctuary. So we remember and honor that relationship of the Eagle Squadrons today. To open today's program, I'm very happy to introduce to you a gentleman who's made quite a journey to be with us, uh, Brigadier General Maurice McKinney. General. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, distinguished guests. You know, Hardy. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm uh, Maurice McKinney. I'm the Chief of Staff for the Air National Guard. I work out at Jefferson City. When I'm not in uniform, I'm a civilian with the National Counterterrorism Center. So I get to play a military guy on the weekend. So this is a great honor. Uh, uh, before I get started, they gave me a quote to read, but you, you know, any good general just, just doesn't take a quote and just read it. You got to do a little research. So before I get started, uh, I wanted to be a uh, quote. Uh, before his speech, I wanted to give you kind of some, some facts about uh, the speech, uh, the quotes that I'm going to read about Winston Churchill. I thought they were very interesting. So I did a little research and I looked up on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube now, right? So even us old guys, before YouTube was around, we can look up on YouTube. So I encourage everybody to take a look at YouTube. There is a 44 minute one, but then there's a five minute one. So it depends on if you want to go to sleep at night, you pick which one you want to look at. So here's some interesting facts about the speech that uh, uh, Sir Winston Churchill gave here, right, right here at this, uh, at this college back in 1945. Uh, Frank McClure, then president of this college, invited Winston Churchill. Uh, to, to, to deliver a speech. Well, it just didn't stop there. It went all the way to President Truman. So President Truman personally signed the invitation to bring uh, Winston Churchill here. And so as part of that, the president actually joined Winston Churchill here. So I thought that was, that was huge. A very good, interesting fact that gave it international exposure. So at that time, uh, some uh, say that the speech that uh, Winston Churchill gave here back in 1945 was one of his best speeches that he's ever gave. So here it is. 
And I'm going to read the prepared marks. So Winston Churchill of Ally, uh, on Allied Air Power from Sanusa speech, Iron Curtain speech, March 5th, 1946, here at Westminster College. From the advent of aviation in the early 20th century, Winston Churchill advocated its use in defense of liberty in the skies throughout the world. After witnessing the powerful and positive influence of an Allied Air Force during World War II, in his speech delivered here, Churchill proposed a joint Air Force to protect democracy wherever it's needed. He said, and I quote, I propose that each of the powers and states should be invited to delegate a certain number of air squadrons to the service of the world organization. These squadrons will be trained and prepared in their own countries, but will move around in rotation from one country to another. They will wear the uniform of their own countries, but with different badges. They would not be required to act against their own nation, but in other speeches, they would be directed by the world organization, kind of like what we know today as NATO. This would be started at a modest scale and would grow as confidence grew. I wish to see this done after the First World War, and I devoutly trust it may be done forthwith Winston Churchill, Sanusa Peace, Sanusa Peace uh, Peace, 5 March 1946 at Westminster College, Fulton, Missouri. So thank you. That was his speech. And then we have up next is Randall Gazer. Thank you all. Good morning. So, uh, my name is Randall Gelzer. I'm the director of uh, state and local government affairs for the Boeing Company. Um, and I wanted to sh next share with you an excerpt uh, from Prime Minister Winston Churchill's speech to the House of Commons on August 20th, 1940. <clears throat> the gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in the constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by, by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. All hearts go out to the fighter pilots, whose brilliant actions we see with our own eyes day after day, but we must never forget that all the time, night after night, month after month, our bomber squadrons travel far into Germany, find their targets in the darkness by the highest navigational skill, aim their attacks, often under the heaviest fire, often with serious loss, with deliberate, careful discrimination, and inflict shattering blows upon the whole of the technical and war-making structure of the Nazi power. On no part of the Royal Air Force does the weight of the war fall more heavily than on the daylight bombers, who will play an invaluable part in the case of invasion and whose unflinching zeal has been necessary in the meanwhile on the numerous occasions to restrain. And I'll next be followed by uh, Gary Joyner. Gary. In Grosvenor Square in London, there is a, an obelisk 15 feet tall uh, dedicated to the Eagle Squadrons. And atop it is an American Eagle uh, preparing to take flight, its wings uplifted. It's an American Eagle. And it was uh, dedicated in, in 1985 uh, by Margaret Thatcher, which I think is a, is a pretty nice uh, responsibility for those of us historians who love her, love Britain, and love the Eagle Squadrons. It's a four-sided obelisk. One side has uh, text. The other three have uh, the badges of the three squadrons and then the list of the dead. So I, I thought the best thing that I could do to honor them is to read what 
the main side of the obelisk says. <clears throat> Eagle Squadrons, this memorial is to the memory of the 244 American and 16 British fighter pilots and other personnel who served in the three Royal Air Force Eagle Squadrons prior to the participation of the United States of America in the Second World War. They served with valor. Founded by Charles F. Sweeney, June 1940, uh, it was erected through the uh, generosity of the Hearst Corporation of America in the name of William Randolph Hearst. The three squadrons, 71, 121, 131, became, upon the entry of the United States several months afterwards, the 334th, 335th, 336th fighter squadrons, which became the fourth fighter group based in Debden. And uh, I've got a personal note in this. My dad was in 336, so uh, it's, a, it's a good long road to study for a historian, I'll tell you. Next up is Mark Sutherland. Well, good morning. On behalf of Her Majesty's Government and also the Spirit of St. Louis Air Show and STEM Expo, which has the honor and privilege of hosting the Royal Air Force Red Arrows next month, I highly encourage you to come visit. It is an honor to be here and be part of this ceremony, which is the continuation of the strengthening and the building of the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States and Missouri in particular. I have the privilege of reading a couple of verses of prose that were inspired by that special relationship. An American airman, John McGee, who was flying in the United Kingdom in 1941 at 30,000 feet above the English fields, wrote this poem. It's called High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Would like to ask Lieutenant General Harding to approach. Well, that's for the, the end of the English accent today. You're going to get an Arkansan accent. <laughs> Listen, I've been asked to uh, read a letter from one of the members of the 71st um, who unfortunately did not make it home. I need to put it in context today. I'm a previous member of the mighty 8th, 8th Air Force. 8th Air Force had a lot to do with Eagle Squadrons. But before the 8th Air Force arrived, after the Germans uh, de foolishly declared war against the United States, and we returned the favor by declaring it against them on the 7th of uh, December was, of course, Pearl Harbor, and the Germans almost immediately declared war, and a couple of days later, the United States Congress again returned the favor. Already in existence were, were the Eagle Squadrons, which had an interesting road to get to the United Kingdom because the United States was a neutral at the time. So how do you get to fight with uh, the RAF, the Royal Air Force? Well, you, you might go through Canada, and a number of them did, um, and uh, found themselves in, in this fight. The letter I'm going to read today is from John, he went by Pappy Lutz. He's actually uh, was born and raised in Fulton, Missouri. Went to school at Westminster uh, for a period of time. And then when he was 25 years old, 
uh, joined the 71st Eagle Squadron. Um, he joined along with Czechs and, 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 and Air Forces of Poland, France, Belgium, Holland, Norway, um, who had a great weight in that fight as well. They trained in Spitfire, Spitfires, or Spitz for short. Um, after the United States entered the war, he got there in, in roughly uh, a few months before the United States entered the war. Uh, the United States converted uh, or brought in P-47 Thunderbolts, an, another fighter aircraft. So he retrained into the Thunderbolts and became part of the Mighty Eighth, Eighth Air Force. Few people know this, but there is not another American unit in World War II that had more casualties than Eighth Air Force. Eighth Air Force was principally a bomber command. Uh, they flew B-17s. There are 10 crew members in every B-17, a pilot, a co-pilot, a radio operator, a navigator, and six gunners. So every time we lost a B-17, we lost 10 airmen. So the idea was somehow we need to prevent these losses so we'll marry up the fighter crews with the bomber crews. We don't do that anymore, but we did it out of necessity in uh, the early days of World War II and throughout the end of the war. And, uh, and First Lieutenant Lutz was part of that effort as a member of the, uh, uh, the uh, 56th and, I'm sorry, the 4th Fighter Group. Um, his squadron, the 71st, as you've heard, became the 334th Fighter Squadron. Now the problem with this philosophy or this strategy was that the fighters couldn't follow the bombers all the way to the target. They didn't have enough fuel. So elements of the command would, would follow the bombers to a certain point where they as we would say, go bingo fuel. They were almost out of fuel. They needed to turn around and go home. And then the Luftwaffe took over and would shoot down the bombers. The bombers would enter a flak field, more, more casualties, more losses, come out of the flak field, meet the Luftwaffe again, and eventually meet a returning flight of, uh, of uh, Eighth Air Force members, or in the case of Lutz, uh, members of the uh, Eagle Squadron. On the 4th of May, uh, 1943, uh, he was picked to uh, escort the bombers home from their bomb run. The target that day was Antwerp. It may seem strange, but um, the factories there were, were Ford and GM factories, European varieties, um, that uh, could uh, build uh, armored vehicles. This was the first effort to try to marry up the fighters with the bombers. On the way, uh, on the way there, he uh, uh, noticed a, a, a British flight uh, dived on six um, 109s, uh, German fighters. Um, that worked out partially successful, but he took a, a round into his engine. A lot of speculation that it probably hit the fuel line. He uh, bailed out, but at 2,000 feet, that's not a good thing. And the chute didn't fully open. He was presumed killed in action. If you go to Europe today, you will see a number of cemeteries there. Uh, uh, run by the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Battle Monuments Commission. And they pay tribute, and they have interred the remains of many that died in the Normandy campaign. But f as far as the airmen, most of their remains were never recovered because they either landed in the English Channel or the North Sea, as in the case of, uh, of Lutz, of, of Lieutenant Lutz. But their names are listed on a wall at every one of those. So if you go to Henri Chapelle in Belgium, you will see uh, Lieutenant Lutz from Fulton, Missouri's name proudly entered among those that are, that are missing. So let me read this letter. It's from his best friend, who was also flying fighters at that time with the same squadron. And it's addressed to First Lieutenant Lutz's mother. It's the day after he was shot down. May the 5th, 1943. Dear Mrs. Lutz, I've been sitting here for an hour trying to think of a way to tell you but I know no matter how I said it, the hurt would be nonetheless. Pappy and I have been friends and roommates since this whole thing started in Bakersfield. I loved him more than any brother could, and losing him is like losing half of myself. I know that you must want to know the circumstances, so I'll try to tell you as best I can. Yesterday, about 6 p.m. our time, we had quite a big show over Holland. Uh, we were doing escort for quite a number of bombers and got into quite a mix-up over flushing. There were more than a few Huns up, and the fight was everywhere. 
Pappy and I were in the same squadron, but different flights. I was with him most of the time, but the last I saw of him, he was diving down on six FW-190s. I'm sorry, but I lost him then for the time, for at that time, I was getting quite busy as well. Lieutenant Bud Kane, however, was his number two, his wingman, and saw the whole thing. Pappy made a good attack, but in the melee, evidently got a bullet in his oil line or such. He definitely was all right then, for he called me on the radio and said his engine was acting up, and he was going home. Bud Kane stayed with him all the way, but about halfway across, he called again and said that he was bailing out. The words he used, ma'am, were, Hively, it's a damn shame, but I'm ha gonna have to get my new boots wet. He bailed out at 2,000 feet. His chute only partially opened and he never got into his dinghy. Bud stayed with him for over 15 minutes, but I'm afraid I can offer no hope, for I have none myself. Everything was done that was possible. The air sea rescue was out until dark, and it doesn't get dark here until 10 p.m and again this morning, but there's no sign. I have collected his belongings together. I'll send them straight away. He particularly wanted his father to have his gun and knife. I have quite a few pictures about, and I'll send them under a different cover. He wanted all his letters destroyed. There is so little I can say, and yet so much I feel. If the good Lord is willing to let me come through this, I shall most certainly come see you as soon as I can. Please write me. And maybe you would like to write my mother. She never met Pappy, but she knows him well from all I've written. Her address is Miss Zella Hively, 1463 Lincoln Road, Columbus, Ohio. Though you have lost your son, ma'am, it may help you to know that he went as any man would be proud to go, doing his duty, protecting an ideal he loved, and with a joke on his lips. Pappy and I, had such great plans for after the war. Forever yours, Howard D. Hively. Thank you. We are gathered together in this chapel of the Eagle Squadron to receive this ensign, which is presented by Air Commodore James Linter, OBE. No more fitting place could be found to deposit such an emblem of duty and of service than this hallowed and venerable house of God, constructed in Great Britain in a time of peace, all but destroyed in London during a fiery time of war, and painstakingly rebuilt here at Westminster College, Fulton, Missouri, where it remains today an everlasting symbol of resilience, hope, peace, and liberty for which so much is owed by so many. Mr. President, I ask you to accept this ensign for safe lodging within these walls in recognition and commemoration of the Eagle Squadrons of the Royal Air Force. May its presence here sustain and strengthen the special relationship between our two nations, a phrase first said here by Winston Churchill in Fulton 73 years ago. We receive this ensign for safe lodging within this chapel of the Eagle Squadron. We now place within this chapel of the Eagle Squadrons this emblem of duty and of service. May all who look upon it be reminded of their duty to God and to their country. Now please stand for the national anthems of Great Britain and the United States.
Please be seated. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Air Commodore James Linter, and I'm the British Air Attaché to the United States, based out of Washington, D.C. And as a British officer, it's a huge and immense pleasure to be here at a site made so famous by Winston Churchill, which honours that great man. I only wish that I had his wit and skill of oratory, and in a few minutes, you too will feel the same way. <laughs> Most of the great quotes are either his or Mark Twain's. One of the ones I like from him, which has also been attributed to that Missouri man, is that uh, if you want me to speak for two minutes, it will take me three weeks of preparation. If you want me to speak for an hour, I'm ready now. You'll be lucky to know that I've had quite a long time to think about this on the drive from DC, so I'll keep it fairly brief. It's a huge honor to present a Royal Air Force ensign to this fabulous uh, Wren Chapel. In recognition of the Eagle Squadrons who fought for Britain, democracy and freedom prior to the United States' official entry into World War II, and in recognition of the close partnership we continue to enjoy. When Sam Craghead and I were exchanging emails a little while ago, and he explained that you had a Union flag in this chapel, but no Royal Air Force ensign, I was clearly only too happy to oblige. And we've heard this morning already of the history of the Eagle Squadrons, of their sacrifice, and the sacrifice of your Missouri local, Lieutenant John Lutz, Fulton Mann, and a former pupil at this college. This ensign recognizes the Eagle Squadrons, their courage, dedication, and sacrifice. The freedom we enjoy today was paid for by their, by their efforts. And that bond between our nations continues today, exemplified by our continued service together and operations around the world, and also our combined activities in space and cyberspace. Together, we share production of the F-35, the next generation of stealth fighter, entering service with both your Air Forces and our Royal Air Force, our bases of RAF Marham and Lake Mead are only miles apart, and they will share in taking this new aircraft and its weapon system forward and becoming sort of the centrepiece of NATO air defence. Our newest aircraft carrier, Queen Elizabeth, will actually be conducting sea and air trials off the east coast of the United States this autumn, or well, fall in American, and uh, in 2021, when it first embarks on its first operational service, will carry not only a Royal Air Force F-35 squadron, but also a US Marine Corps F-35 squadron. And here in the US, we have over 450 Royal Air Force personnel stationed in 38 different states. And not far from here, up the road at Whiteman Air Force Base, we have a B-2 exchange pilot. But our footprint extends, as I say, across the states, including pilots, space operators, and people at the heart of the decision-making processes in defence and making our future projects more, more possible. That close affiliation epitomised by the Eagle Squadron is as important today as it was during England's darkest hour. And what of those Eagle Squadrons? Well, those squadrons won 34 Distinguished Flying Crosses. There were three US and two British pilots awarded a bar for the Distinguished Flying Cross, so more than one award of the same medal. And one US and two British pilots were received the Distinguished Service Order. As we've heard, on the 29th of September 1942, the three squadrons were officially transferred from the Royal Air Force into the 8th Air Force of the United States Army Air Forces. And 71, 121 and 133 squadrons became the 334th, 335th and 336th squadrons, retaining their Spitfires. Those squadrons still exist today. Those three squadrons now fly the F-15E Strike Eagle at Seymour Johnson in North Carolina. And just continuing the link, there is still an RAF officer on those squadrons. Flight Lieutenant Sam Jenkins is currently flying with them to, at this moment. That special relationship formed and recognized nearly 80 years ago continues and is as strong as ever. Thank you very much.
Thank you. That concludes today's ceremony. I invite each of you to join us in the Undercroft, where we will formally open a new exhibition uh, about Winston Churchill and the RAF, drawn from items in the museum's permanent collection. Uh, it's a terrific exhibition and a chance for us to show uh, many objects uh, that we don't normally put on view, including that poignant letter uh, from Mr. Hively to Mrs. Lutz, which is on display publicly for the first time today. So please join us, and again, thank you for being with us. Distinguished guests, President Lampkin, carry on that special relationship. Thank you.